When a comet collided with a deep section of the Indian Ocean around 5,000 years ago, the mega tsunami that was generated absolutely inundated and decimated the shorelines of every continent that was within the direct reach of the impact crater. From Africa to the Middle East, to India, Asia and Australia, every continent bears the marks from this event, either in the form of deep gashes carved into the bedrock of the land that stretches for kilometres, or in the massive arrow-like hills that are left behind following these types of massive mega tsunami type of events known as chevrons. Some places bear the marks more than others, with more clear and easier to see visual evidence occurring in places that are more arid and that contain little vegetation, such as here in Western Australia, and in places in Northeastern Africa, like here in Somalia, where we can see the deep carvings in the land that were etched with force by the severe erosive action unleashed by the unfathomably tall tidal wave that slammed into here at one point in time in history. In our last episode, we discussed the damage and present day evidence of this mega tsunami that exists within Perth, the capital city of Western Australia, which was absolutely hammered when this mega tsunami made contact with this area and was especially affected as a result of its funnel like topography, which would have increased the ramp up height of the mega tsunami as it made contact with the land. I discussed the evidence, including what physical changes to the land this mega tsunami event left behind, and I teach you what they look like and what to look for in that episode, and it's best to watch it before this one as a result of that. The link to it will be both in the description down below or on the top right of the screen. In this episode, we'll discuss the damage that was inflicted to Victoria, Tasmania, and the islands between the two of which some incredible destruction was wrought on the coastline of pretty much all of these places. I was originally going to do the rest of Australia all in one video until I realised that damage from this mega tsunami was so widespread it turned into a 30 or 40 minute video, so instead I've decided to break it up into two. This episode will focus on Tasmania, Victoria and the islands between, and the next episode will cover South Australia and the significant damage found in the northern parts of Western Australia, as well as what occurred in the south. The damage inflicted to Australia was widespread following this event. There were very little places that were spared, with only a few sheltered locations existing in a few areas here and there, such as this one in Western Australia just south of Perth, which was sheltered from the direct impact of the mega tsunami wave by this piece of land here, that jutted out and served as a shield, taking the main impact of the wave instead. Vegetation is lush here, so it's harder to see, but the tsunami left really deep gashes, this area is topographically high too. This part is literally around 150 meters, and look, the wave flew right over it. That's how high this freaking wave was. Scientists believe it was around 180 meters in height. In South Australia and Victoria, the entire land was smashed, including the islands between Victoria and Tasmania, such as King Island, which has several places that were severely impacted by the initial wave. And many of these places include large chevron depositions, such as this obscure little location here, on this tiny little island in the northwestern part of Tasmania, along with many depositions in the lower lying areas of the western coast of Tasmania. So let's start at Tassie and work our way up, documenting the evidence that can be found on the coastlines of every place we see. Our evidence of the mega tsunami strike begins here in the southernmost section of the west coast of Tasmania. This is a very interesting spot because only one area exists that has very clear and distinct chevrons and directional wave damage, with a second lesser affected spot that only hints to what occurred. The rest of this part of Tasmania doesn't have a single bit of evidence. Why? Because these islands blocked it. Look at the evidence on them instead. It's clear that Matsuko Island bore the very main brunt of the wave impact here, as the entire island is dominated by chevrons, and it was heavily altered following this event as a result of this. The waves hit here and here, and this is the second less obvious spot, a very high cliff face, that shows the erosive visual pattern of a very large wave impact and retreat, along with the aforementioned spot here, with clear chevron deposits. 
So moving on to the western coast of Tasmania, and here, even on Google Maps or Google Earth, you can see the areas affected by the mega tsunami by just looking at the directional strips of bare sand that exist. This, to me, is a telltale sign that I've seen time and time again all across Australia and even the world. These little sandy strips that just kind of pop out, and they're always in the direction that the wave would have travelled from when the comet impacted the Indian Ocean. And when you don't see them, it's because they've been blocked by some kind of island or obstruction that bore the brunt of the direct impact instead, such as what happened in this area here. The clear evidence that we have of the mega tsunami hitting this region is of this deep sediment dump over here. Notice the direction of it. The wave hit from this angle. So there's parts where sediment was deposited in such a vast amount that vegetation still hasn't regrown on all of the chevrons deposited here, with other parts of it being dominated by plant growth. Now check out what this wave has done to the surrounding mountains here. It stripped them bare and carved into them in a directional manner, leaving these deep scathing tears in the land, which were engraved as a direct result of the force of the impact and the subsequent water movement following it. The major erosive forces altered both the land and the bedrock immensely after this event occurred, as it literally tore into these mountains and sculpted them in a near instant. You can see how they differ from the more natural erosion channels that the other mountains here have, such as these ones over here. This area bore the direct brunt of the wave, and look how deeply incised it has become as a direct result of that. Now, this is just speculation, but it's a pretty solid theory, in my eyes at least. Based on the scarring of the land, it appears the wave hit from this angle, hopped over this lower part of the mountain range, and followed it all the way through to the other side, leaving behind these massive cuts in the mountain that normally wouldn't be there without this kind of event happening. Also a theory, but at Tasmania's most southern point over here, we have these deep gnashes dug into the bedrock here, which are also facing the same direction that the mega tsunami wave travelled, and whilst their existence might not be attributed to it directly, I'd be willing to bet a part of my manhood that a significant amount of the present day look of it and the erosive direction are directly related to this mega tsunami impacting it, and significantly eroding it, as this entire stretch of land has dozens of west to east oriented tears in the land created by the erosive action of the mega tsunami waves as it travelled over it. It probably completely stripped the sides of these places bare of the topsoil that once existed here and held this place together, significantly changing it in an instant. So as we move north, we can see the same directional chevron depositions and carving of the rugged mountains that dominate the western stretches of the beautiful ancient land of Tasmania, which is around 1.5 billion years old by the way, making it a billion years older than Victoria, New South Wales and almost all of Queensland. These chevrons mainly got deposited in the lower lying areas, and as we move on to the northern tip of Tasmania, we see a rather large fan shape in which a vast amount of chevron accumulations were deposited after the massive 180 odd metre high wave ripped through here. As we move north from Tasmania, here at Trefoil Island, you'd think these massive 80 metre or 260 foot high cliff faces would be enough to kind of shelter it, but nope. Check out these deep gnashes that exist. So we know the wave was at least 80 metres high when it reached here, but based on this evidence it was much, much higher. Obviously it was still around the 180 metre high mark when it hit this part of Australia. This is Hunter Island. It's a pretty big island in northwestern Tasmania and it was absolutely smashed by this mega tsunami. Check out the massive wave damage that's still clearly visible. You can see this on Google Earth too and you can see it very easily. This is because the island's highest peaks are the two bumps on the eastern and western side, and these bumps are between 70 and 58 metres high, so it's safe to say this entire island was submerged for a while when this tsunami strike occurred. On Three Hummock Island, we can see that not as much damage has occurred in the southwestern part of it, as a result of Hunter Island bearing the brunt of the main impact, which sheltered these places. But as we move up towards the line where this sheltering no longer occurred, we can see the impact of the main wave very, very clearly. This occurred because the little section of Hunter Island that the wave passed over was only 40 metres or 131 feet high, 
and it was only a thin strip of land, so it did very little to absorb the force of the main impact, and Three Hummock Island did so as a result of this instead in these parts. At King Island, we have some really intense damage. Like the south is absolutely smashed and the chevrons are very pronounced. The chevron hills themselves can stretch as tall as 117 meters, or 262 feet, meaning this once flat land was converted to a relatively hilly terrain overnight, with 17 meter high hills existing en masse all around you, all of a sudden, pretty much in an instant. Imagine waking up in the morning if you are such a heavy sleeper that you somehow slept through and survived this event, maybe after taking two Ambien, only to be surrounded by sandy hills, you would definitely think you're tripping out, and that's probably why you shouldn't take Ambien. But as we move north, we see the same level of damage. Everywhere. King Island would have been slammed, and I have a sneaking suspicion that the entire upper section of the island here was completely inundated and flooded. I see what appears to be chevrons from this event, along with those typical direction oriented scratches that we see everywhere. Now you might think that from here we'd naturally move on to Victoria, like these are the only places that would have been hit, right? Nope. Flinders Island has these scars. The roughly 20 meter or 65 foot high island got inundated from one side to the other. At Victoria, evidence begins here at Wilson's Prom. The two tourist spots known as the Dunes of the Big Drift and the Little Drift are actually all one big quote unquote drift created by this mega tsunami and by drift I actually mean chevrons. It hit here very hard and it passed over from the ocean into the corner inlet coastal bay. In the south we see more evidence in a topographical low here along with more chevrons. West of this near Venus Bay at the Cape Lip Trap Coastal Park Chevrons stretch en masse from the south all the way up to and past Venus Bay. This continues up till around the Kulkunda Surf Beach where it then stops. At this point, the wave damage doesn't become substantial until we go to Cape Otway, where the evidence starts and continues all along the coastline. The massive limestone cliffs that exist all along the Great Ocean Road broke much of the wave's main impact in most of the areas. With that being said though, the waves still easily scaled these cliff faces and it did sweep inland, but the strength of it was dramatically reduced and it didn't stretch as far inland as it would have had these cliffs not existed here like they do to such a pronounced degree. The lower lying areas however weren't as fortunate, and massive scars and chevrons do exist. We have places like here at Air River, where the chevron deposits can still be seen even with the vegetative growth and check out the wave damage here that stretches inland for 3.5 kilometers. Insane stuff. At Johanna River, near the beach campground, we have another set of chevrons that don't reach quite as far inland, but that can still be seen even using satellite view on Google. As we move along, who knows how many apostles stood before this mega tsunami hit, but it was probably a lot more than the eight that are left standing today as these beautiful limestone stacks. The steepness of these cliffs bore the brunt of this wave, and honestly I see very little impact evidence worth discussing aside from a few gnashes in the land here and there. So let's move along to the next place of significance, Warrnambool. Oh man, this place got slammed seriously. It's a topographic low of around 32 meters or 104 feet high, and geez, the chevrons here are amongst the largest in Victoria. Truly fascinating stuff to see. As we go west, past Port Ferry, the same chevron-like damage begins again at the crags. Continuing along at Cape Bridgewater, we see another series of major tsunami chevron deposits. This area is still recovering from the damage unleashed 5,000 years ago, and the deposition is so pronounced that the vegetation has still not regrown. Look at the clear direction the chevrons are travelling to. That's why we were able to so easily locate the crater from these types of events and the deposition that was left. These chevrons reach up to a ridiculous 40 meters or 131 feet high. In our next episode, things ramp up in intensity. South Australia has some areas where some pretty formidable damage exists. Massive chevron deposits, so tall that the vegetation has never been able to regrow. Evidence of this event increases in intensity before peaking in the northwestern parts of Western Australia, where the most significant evidence of this event can be found. 
And on top of this, I've made what I think might be the first discovery of what appears to be chevron-like shapes in Indonesia. Researchers have often noted how there doesn't really seem to be any visible damage that exists in India, Sri Lanka, or in Indonesia. And this is true, this wave damage is really evident in Australia, and then we see very little evidence again until it picks up suddenly in Pakistan. With only one region existing in India that I think might have evidence of a direct hit. I will explain my theory behind why these places didn't receive a direct impact like the Middle East, Africa, Australia, and as you will soon see, Indonesia maybe did. And it's a very fascinating story. And we'll be hopping from continent to continent, ending our series in Africa, after which we'll cover the global deluge that occurred from this event post-impact, before ending it there. So stick around and I hope to see you all there, because some of this damage in Indonesia is so immense, but the forests have completely hidden it. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. And I think it's really going to blow your mind. And I'm hoping to one day go there in person to prove this theory. Thanks for watching.